2021 IXL conference hosted by the BCIT Student Association. My name is Hunter Soans and I'm the president of the BCIT Student Association. I would like to begin by acknowledging that BCIT is located on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. I had the privilege to attend IXL in 2020, and I learned how I could better myself as a leader. In just one short year, I feel that I've been able to use the skills I gained from IXL and apply them to my everyday life, whether it be in group projects, at the SA, at work, or even in some of my close friendships. I can confidently say that the tools you acquire at this conference can make a lasting positive impact in your life if you choose to apply them. Now traditionally, IXL is a one-day conference event held at the Burnaby campus where we can see up to 250 attendees participate in keynote, panel, and breakout sessions. For obvious reasons, we've had to change this up quite a bit for 2021. This year, we've shifted to a new online format and theme that's fitting to the times we live in today. We did this to try to reach and relate to as many students, alumni, staff, faculty, and industry professionals as we can. Forbes recently published an article called Great Leadership Starts with Self-Awareness by Chinwe SMI. It states that self-awareness has been cited as the most important capability for leaders to develop. Successful leaders know where their natural inclinations lie and use this knowledge to either boost those inclinations or compensate for them. The one constant factor in all of your endeavors is you, so understanding yourself is therefore paramount. And so, IXL 2021 is all about investing in yourself. This year, we will be sharing a video series with industry and development leaders that will invite you to invest in your education and in your career. You will be asked to self-reflect, dig deep, and truly learn how to invest in yourself. Each month, throughout January, February, March, and April, we will release a new video with new speakers and topics around investing in yourself. We want to acknowledge and lean into the fact that investing in yourself is a commitment and not something that can be accomplished at a one-day event. So be sure to check back on our website for updates and links to the videos. Now, to kick off our conference, we have our keynote speaker session titled as Know Thyself, Leadership and the Enneagram. Our speaker today is Jean-Pierre Leblanc, a leadership coach uh, with the Alchemy Network and co-founder of Sage Natural Wellness. Jean-Pierre transformed his pain from chronic fibromyalgia into a series of natural remedies and products which led to the co-founding of Sage Natural Wellness. Jean-Pierre also developed a holistic coaching model to help others live intentionally and in alignment with their purpose and core values. Today, Jean-Pierre is joined by Rachel Hayek, a leadership coach who is passionate about helping people tune into their wisdom. Rachel truly believes that kindness, compassion, collaboration are the keys to effective leadership. Today in this session, you will not only learn the importance of the concept, know thyself, but also appreciate truly uh, what you are passionate about and understand the importance of wellness when it comes to leadership. Thank you so much for joining us today on this journey and we hope that you enjoy our two keynote speakers. Cheers. My name is Rachel Hayek. I'm a coach and wellness facilitator, and I'm here today with Jean-Pierre LeBlanc. Jean-Pierre is the co-founder of Sage Natural Wellness. You may have seen some of these stores in your local shopping center. He is also the founder of the Alchemy Network, a personal growth consulting business. He is here today to talk to you about wellness, leadership, and the Enneagram, Jean-Pierre. It's great to be on this call with you. And I want to acknowledge and, um, and really celebrate with all of you who are on the call because one of the things I've learned about leadership is we each have our own version of leadership. Um, I'm always a little skeptical about books that say this is how you're a leader because I think individuals each have their own style and so so the first thing to do is to really understand one's personal style with life so that one can step into one's personal style of leadership. So the theme of today is know thyself. And in doing so, 
um, great things can be accomplished first in one's own relationship with oneself, i.e. peace of mind. Secondly, in a relationship with others, whether it's a significant other, a parent, a friend, or a sibling. And third, the ability to have an impact on the planet for whatever project you have in mind to make it a better planet. Um, leadership has everything to do with whether you're gonna play a small game or a larger game. So what would you like to to ask me next. Well, first of all, I want to touch on the Enneagram. So we asked the students to complete a test before they watch this video. And I know that when I originally did the Enneagram test, I mistyped as a two and later learned that I identify more with nine. Could you speak a little bit about the test before we get into our talk? So what I love about the Enneagram is it's the only organization that basically says, don't trust our tests. Um, there's multiple tests online and they all average more or less 66% um, accuracy, which means that of every three people who test, one of them will actually mistest. And what I remember fondly um, with yourself, Rachel, is we thought you were an Enneagram to the helper giver until we realized your mom was the helper giver and that you were the Enneagram that actually knows how to mimic any Enneagram you want. And so in seeing your mom being helpful and generous, you thought, well, why don't I be like her? But once we discovered your true Enneagram, we discovered your true gifts, we discovered your most important values and didn't that help you become the leader that you are today? So, um, so rule one, don't really trust the test. Go figure out, let, let the test be an introduction to a likelihood of your Enneagram. And then as you read up about the test often will give you two or three choices that are high up. Um, make sure that you are the one that chooses what your Enneagram is, not the test, not your friends, or not even an expert uh, like Rachel. Okay. So with know thyself, we, we know ourselves best. So Exactly. Got well, it. actually, funny you should say that. Uh, over time, we know ourselves best. At first, I would say that I was as misguided as most um, because I was who I kept hearing my parents, my teachers, my friends tell me who I was. And um, even today, later in my years, I'm still discovering things about myself. So it's a lifelong quest, um, but you get a, I would say, quantum leap the moment you discover the Enneagram. And, um, and it is our job to know ourselves best. And so... Mm -hmm. Let's take that leap together. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of inspiration with all of us. How has the Enneagram specifically impacted your leadership journey? Well, it began by um, the fact that I was a very poor leader. Um, I grew up in an environment where, um, you know, rich old white men ran everything. And, and I thought my job was to become one of those so that one day I could run everything. And uh, along the way discovered that this was a very old fashioned way to lead and not a very efficient one. And, um, and I discovered through the Enneagram that uh, contrary to my belief that I was a brain type person who thought things through, I was actually a heart or emotion based type decision maker. And it was the opening of my heart, the last thing I wanted to do, you know, I thought, you know, you don't need to love me, just respect me was my understanding of my upbringing as a leader. And then I discovered that if I was willing to open my heart and really be who I was, and there's a vulnerability there, then people would be willing to follow me on higher paths, like, a, you know, building a business that was going to help the wellness of millions of people. Um, but it really took that shift. And it's a shift I had to do over and over. So um, it was only in my mid career that I began to discover what my true leadership style was. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, I thought it was being a business leader and that my true leadership showed up as a coach. 
And it was only once I started to help people one-on-one -on -one that I discovered where my real leadership skill was. And still today, my one-on-one -on -one time is my most powerful. So I heard you say in there that you discovered your true leadership style mid-career. So what a gift you're offering these students at the beginning of their career. I agree. This amazing system. I also wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit. You mentioned thinking that you were more of a thinker, but then realized that you're a heart-based leader. Can you talk a little bit about the body centers within the Enneagram? There's three intelligence centers, and uh, the obvious one is the head. The less obvious one is the heart. And the one that intuitive people already know is the gut. So there are some people, we use all three. And in fact, the Enneagram tells us that we are all nine Enneagrams but we have some sort of um, at home places or places that are patterns. And so my pattern is three and I tend to uh, go back to three and be a leader from the heart. Um, and that um, is so different than how I started um, because I thought only people who were smart should be running things. And yeah, I do have some smarts, um, but it was my love for um, changing the way business was done and my love for changing the way medicine was done that really drove me and that really attracted those who wanted to uh, join me in that quest of supporting people. Um, as you know, Sage is all about you becoming your own health practitioner and nature becoming your first medicine. And it was because you shared a value uh, of that, that you once joined me uh, for those three years where you were my assistant. And then because you developed your own leadership style, you basically said, hey, I'd like to be a trainer and a coach. And so that was your shift into your leadership style. And mine became taking a back seat to the direct leadership of Sage and finding out how I could support those leaders who wanted the support. So so heart-based leaders, they have people in mind. Can you talk a little bit about thought-based leaders and gut-based leaders and how they show up sure. in the world? So you'll know you are a head type leader because you're constantly assessing possibilities, causalities. It's almost like you're running a spreadsheet in your head. Like you, you're seeing everything that can happen. You're sizing up risk you're sizing up opportunity, you're counting things. I remember having a date with uh, Kate at the really early part of my relationship. And she said to me at the end of the date, you know, this restaurant's not gonna make it. And I said, well, what do you mean? She says, well, there's 26 tables with an average of four chairs per table. And there's only so many people and there's so many uh, sittings and they're just not going to make it. And I'm going like, wow, how boring a date must I have been that she had time to do all that. But it turns out that it's what she does. As a matter of course, she's always counting things. Her head is just working in overtime while someone else, my daughter, for example, is a gut type. So again, she has a head and a heart that works very well, but her natural way of making decisions is her gut. So a good example of a business decision at Sage is Kate would come up with a number of possibilities for a new product that she would have found out through her travels and her, her figurings out. And then she would bring Kiara in who would say, well, mom, that one. And it was so obvious to Kiara because she felt it in her body. So it was an instant black and white. And so gut people know that decisions actually, if they'll listen to their body, they come very easily to them. And my heart type was about figuring out that mom was a head type and Kiara was a gut type and encouraging them to make decisions that way. And that's how they made their best decisions. So each has a role and, and they're very distinctive once you figure out what they are. Um, so like I said, even though we're using all three, there is one that is our dominant way of making a decision. So three bodies of intelligence, three types of people making decisions. And then in the Enneagram, the other three types is there are people who just naturally want to take charge and they move quickly and they're sometimes hard to follow. And, um, and, and that's their most natural drive. There's also a side of them, 
um, and for some people it's their dominant way, which want to support. They, they find they have a more middle pace of, of action and uh, they, get, they get their kicks out of helping those leaders that they think um, can um, uh, do something good for the planet or good for the community. And then there are those who like to kind of sit back and absorb and notice things. And they can be your greatest experts and or your greatest artists, um, or in your case, the greatest peacemakers, because they bring in diversity, inclusion, they, they hear everybody, like nobody can be a coach like an Enneagram nine, because first they listen. And when they've listened well, they'll say, and so now what are you going to do about this? And again, they listen well. And so, um, so you can really see how there is a purpose to each, lead, to, to each Enneagram type. And there's a form of leadership that comes out of each Enneagram type. Mm. And it sounds like they all complement each other as well. They do. And that's why a business is best ran from a, uh, what I'll call a synergistic blend of leaders, supporters, uh, people who have the, you know, I'll call them the experts. Um, and so if there was a team made up of just one Enneagram, which is a tendency when I started a uh, stage, I, I wanted to just hire threes um, because I shared values with them. But then who was going to do the accounting? Threes are notorious for um, not really wanting to get that deeply into the details. And so I quickly discovered I better have a different Enneagram. And thank God I was married to Kate, who was my business partner. Um, so she leaned into the accounting while I leaned into developing the people. And then when Kiara came along, uh, she had a strong creative side and she can make a hundred decisions a day without breaking a sweat um, because they were coming from her guts. So when she got into the uh, product development, um, she was developing over a hundred products a year um, to create the newness and the excitement. So um, three different leadership styles that actually could have conflicted we could have been at each other's throats, except that we understood our differences. And so the arguments were at a minimum and the productivity was at a maximum. That covers the, the three intelligence centers and three social styles. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about self-care and how you practice self-care as a leader. I find that the, um, you can't lead others if you can't lead yourself. And the kind of leadership for myself that I find most valuable is understanding how to bring the most of me to whatever. And if I didn't get a good night's sleep, um, I'm groggy or foggy or um, not able to be as present. And the funny thing is the first thing that happens when you're tired is you can't tell that you're not being present. And so there's a lot of people who are practically sleepwalking, who have no idea how much productivity they're leaving on the table. And at the end of the day, they're exhausted and they haven't accomplished anywhere near as much as they think because many of the things they've done is gonna to need to be redone. So sleep is number one. And I like to put it as a, a three-way priority with sleep as the first and foremost, because the second is digestion, food, nutrition. And if you haven't slept well, you won't digest those organic carrots. And then the third is movement. And if you haven't slept well and haven't eaten well, you'll go to the gym. And because you'll have inflammation in your body, you'll end up hurting yourself and not creating something sustainable. So I find that the best leaders know the importance of being well slept, well fed, and, and have some movement in their body so that um, they can bring all of themselves to whatever situation that they can offer leadership to. Great, so we've got, as leaders, know thyself, and then we've got these three pillars of wellness, the sleep, nutrition, and the movement. So all that being said- Can I give what? you an example? Yes. I'm gonna give you an example of knowing thyself. So my body type is one that's particularly dry, Right now, I'm in a situation where um, the heating is on full and it's very dry in here. And if I wasn't taking in some water through this interview, 
I would actually lose some brain function and be more likely to have brain fog or not be completely following everything you say or give you my best answers. So that's an example of knowing my, some people don't need water the way I do, but um, I know that this environment and this particular body and this timing requires it. And I know in, in the world of wellness, we use a phrase, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Um, and so that idea of we need to take care of ourselves in order to be in service to others. But we have to know what that oxygen mask looks like. like what does it take to take care of ourselves? So I'm, I'm hearing in what you're saying that you know exactly what it is you need. And I know that your favorite tool is the Enneagram. And I also know that you're a self-preservation three. So we've talked about the social styles, the centers of intelligence. Can we talk a little bit about the instincts? and what self-preservation means to you. Yeah, on the subject of looking after myself, I'm fortunate to have uh, self-preservation on the top of a, um, it's like a stack of pancakes. So, um, uh, so some people like myself, self-preservation, which is really preservation because it applies to anybody who comes near me, I'm concerned about their wellness and do they have a scarf if they're going out in the cold and, and, and so on. So that's, that's, my top of the stack. In the middle of my particular stack, I have um, uh, what some people call one-on-one -on -one, or I call intensity. The books call it sexual, but in this day and age, I think it's inappropriate to use that word. So I'm going to stick with intensity. And so that's like um, Kate has intensity on top of her stack. So if I say, hey, honey, let's go for a walk and talk about this. She'll say, no, we're going to sit right here and we're going to look in each other's eyes and we're going to talk this through. And like, so um, she'll go to a party and sit down with one person she finds interesting and spend half the night with them and have a really deep and powerful conversation. That's the intensity piece. And then Kiara represents the, what she has on top and I have on the bottom is the social. And the social is that person who just naturally just gets along with people. They, they know what to say and when to say it. And, and, and they see everybody as a friend they haven't met yet. And uh, it's wonderful to watch. And so um, knowing that social is at the bottom of my stack, I've spent the last 20 years working on my social style and, and learning how to just be easier to get along with and just a nicer person. Um, and for Kiara, she's been learning how to take care of herself more because it doesn't come naturally to her. So she has to make a, a particular attention or have a partner that she can say, hey, um, I never take my vitamins. You know, would, would you keep an eye on that for me? Or would you, would you remind me? And so knowing ourselves, we can pay attention to whatever part of our subtype or our instinct that is on the weaker side. And I think it's really interesting, Jean-Pierre, that as you're talking, I'm hearing you talk about these experience on a sort of continuum where the, the commitment to learning about yourself and applying the Enneagram as a, as a tool to learn more deeply about yourself as a leader, it sounds like it's an ongoing process that doesn't end. Can you speak to that a little bit? It's interesting that if you can have a sense of humor about it, um, there's a saying I love that says, uh, if you will laugh at yourself, you will forever be amused. And, um, and so this oneself can be a little daunting um, because at first we discover things that we don't necessarily want to know. One of the ways I tell people you'll recognize your diagram when you read about it is when you kind of recognize a few things and feel kind of uncomfortable about a few things, um, that suggests that you're probably reading about yourself because um, I discovered, for example, that an Enneagram three is the achiever. And I thought, yeah, go me, I'm an achiever. And then I found out because I only think bubble when I'm achieving. And I went, oh, that's also true. Not so comfortable. Um, I'm often achieving because I want to be more lovable when I'm forgetting that we're all lovable just because we are. And, and so, um, I, and then there's layers upon layers. So even though what we're offering here is a quantum leap, 
um, to our students to, to kind of get a head start, um, it really, I'm, I'm 30, 33 years into my process of discovering myself. And um, just last night, I watched a T I, I finished a TV series with Kate that gave me a huge insight on myself that I wasn't prepared to look at. And uh, hopefully it will lead to even better leadership move forward. As I now understand that there was this flaw that I, I just wasn't ready to look at. You've heard the statement, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Who would have thought a Netflix series would have been my teacher? But by the time you commit yourself to learning a lot about yourself, everything becomes a teacher. It can be a, 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 an article you read in a in a, in a magazine, it could be a coach that you hire. Um, it's amazing. And it, it, I don't know a bigger gift, you know, you can buy me a new car, but if I don't understand myself, um, I'm struggling in that car. Um, so I'm amazed to see that um, as I do this work, it blesses my relationship um, with others, it blesses my relationship with myself, which looks like really steady health, you know, strong immune system, lots of energy. Um, you know, having energy at the end of the day is an amazing gift. And I find that people who know themselves are able to know others, have great relationships. And at the end of the day, they're still full of energy and having a great time of life. Um, whereas those who don't, I see a lot of exhaustion, I see burnout, I see dissatisfaction. And, um, and so it's a, it's, it's a lot of work and it's a massive payout is how I would mm. put it. I have a question about that, Jean-Pierre. So when it comes to burnout and feeling exhausted at the end of the day, how can the Enneagram support leaders in stepping into more self-awareness and personal responsibility? Well, the moment you understand yourself, you, particularly through the Enneagram, you understand your values. And as you start to move towards your values, the work you choose, and this is really important for students coming out of, uh, coming out with a degree, if they do what they love, truly do what they love, they will not know if they're working or playing. Um, they will attract the best careers and ultimately whatever money they need to have a great life will be there um, because the way things are configured is to support those who are truly doing what they love. And I grew up working for the money and I struggled every year I did that. And when I started to do what I love, uh, the struggle got less and less until there was no struggle left. So it's massively important for someone to um, understand themselves well enough to choose what truly motivates them, not what their teacher said is, are, are gonna be good for them, what, not what their parents told them, but what they have discovered is, um, there's a term in Sanskrit called dharma, their true dharma or life purpose. That can show up very, very early for people if they will do this work. Amazing. And I know there's going to be some point when students head back to campus and they're going to be working together in groups again. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how the Enneagram can serve people working in groups and how knowing yourself can serve people working in groups? Well, because we're at the end of our time, I'll do it. I'll, I'll give you a quick, a quick version. Um, when I was in university and I had to work in a in a group project. And, and I, as I mentioned, I did not have the social skills, didn't know how. The only thing I noticed is that I was good at presenting the project. So I would look for the three people who um, you know, had thick glasses and their head down and were the, like the, the rich students that didn't want, like they would do the work and I would sit with them and facilitate a space and then by the time the work was done, I'd go present it to the class and we'd get great marks. Well, they were brain types that did deep research and came up with good stuff. And I would find a way to present it so everybody understood. And that was an amazing synergy. And um, if I had just, you know, 
join people who were like me, um, we wouldn't have had anywhere near the success. And then you can apply that to any project, you can apply that to a career and just have more impact in the world by creating those very effective teams. So in knowing yourself, you know your strengths and you know what you bring to the group. And then you can see other people's strengths that are different than yours. You can't know others until you know yourself. So there's a lot of people who think they know others. They're just projecting themselves on others. That's a very inefficient, a dangerous way to be. And since we are at the end of our time, what are some parting words you wanna leave these leadership students with? Just a review of what we've seen. Knowing yourself is more critical than you probably know. It's a lifelong thing. So you don't just do an Enneagram test and go, okay, I'm a four and that means that. It's, it's you embark on that. The payoff is massive and sustained and will make everything, including time at school, more pleasant, more effective, give you better marks. And by the time you get into career, you'll have more impact on the world and you'll have more ease with things like abundance. You'll have, that it's not a matter of if, whether you earn a lot or a little, it's that you earn everything you need to accomplish what it is you want to accomplish. And it makes for a very fulfilling life. Thank you so much, Jean-Pierre. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today. The pleasure was mine, Rachel.